Hey everybody, it's really good to see you all here today. I'm gonna to take just a second and go over a couple quick things and then we'll do some introductions. So welcome to our virtual quarantine science cafe. Uh, just a couple quick things that we're gonna ask you to do today. One, introduce yourself in the chat box. You cannot see or hear participants, says Vanessa. Let me see if I can do that, something to fix that. Vanessa, you can't see or hear participants. Can you yeah, hear me? No, no, I was someone asked if we could see or hear participants and I was saying no, we can't hear you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Stuff you should know. Share your thoughts. Introduce yourself in the chat box. Put questions for our speaker in the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom of your screen. Please be courteous, respectful, don't create distractions. Try to keep your chat to thoughts about what our presenter is uh, talking about today. That would be great. And if you don't understand a concept or a word that our presenter today is um, talking about, let us know in the chat box and Vanessa will be here to help you out. So I'm Laura Wilson. I'm with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. We are the 4-H Youth Development Program, which which is the Youth Development Program of the University of Maine, and we're really happy to have you here today. It's really exciting for us to be able to offer these online versions of something that we would, well, we'd rather have you come to the university and see us, but if you can't come here, we're gonna to come to you. So with me today as, as backup here, we have Dr. Vanessa Klein, who is monitoring that chat box with the assistance of Alice Philbrick. Alice and Vanessa are a great team here. We've got Chris Ulett, who is a 4-H educator from one of our county offices, the Androscoggin Sagadahawk County office. We've got Jesse Brainerd here from the State 4-H office, office, who is monitoring your Q&A questions and she'll make sure she gets them to our speaker. And our guest speaker today is Dr. Allison Smart. Allison, Dr. Smart, would you take a minute and introduce yourself and then uh, lead us through your presentation? Sure, I can certainly do that. Uh, my name is Allison Smart, uh, and really, the, I kind of hit on this on my first slide, um, so I can uh, share my screen here. Oh, it's cumbersome. Here we go. Okay. So the name of the kind of cafe talk that I wanted to give today uh, is called the Moldy Plant Detective. Uh, that makes me sound like I'm moldy. I swear I am not. I just really enjoy mold, especially on plants. Um, and my job is basically like a plant detective. And I'll explain a little bit about that as we go on. So I wanted to start with telling you a little bit about myself um, and how I became uh, someone who enjoys looking at moldy plants. Um, so I'm originally from Massachusetts. I'm not from Maine, um, but I love Maine and it means a lot to me to be here. Um, when I was in uh, middle school and thinking about uh, high school, I actually decided that I was not going to go to the regular high school, that I was going to go to an agricultural high school. Um, and the reason for this was because I wasn't so great at school. It didn't come easy for me. Um, I needed something that was more hands-on and felt like something that I could progress in. So I ended up going to an agricultural high school. Uh, and the first year I had to take all these different classes, animal science, uh, plant science, and I took botany. And my botany teacher said that I really had a knack for plants and that my, I should major in uh, uh, just plants in general. And so in that high school, we had to select majors. So I ended up deciding to take plant science. And I'm lucky I did. Um, and I'm really lucky that the teacher had the foresight to tell me that I was good at it because I certainly didn't realize that I was. Uh, and then part of that high school program was to have an internship. And so I interned at a landscape company and 
this landscape company um, was a really high-end landscape company, so multi-million dollar house landscapes I was working on. Uh, and I learned a lot. And I met this one woman who had gone to the University of Florida and gotten her doctorate in plant medicine. And I just thought she was the coolest person. And she knew all these really interesting things about plants and plant diseases and physiology of plants, how plants grow. Um, and so I decided in high school that I was going to get my doctorate and I was going to go to the University of Florida and I was going to get the same degree as her. Um, I kind of did things backwards. Uh, usually people will decide where they're going to do their undergrad, so their bachelor's of science, um, their first four years of college, but I didn't have that figured out. I just knew where I wanted to get my doctorate. Um, so I ended up applying to a school uh, called the Unity College in Maine which is an environmentally, environmental college. Uh, and that's where I did my undergrad, the first, the bachelor's degree. And then I did, I got into the University of Florida in that program, the Doctor of Plant Medicine program. Um, and one thing that you might not know is that Florida has a really uh, perfect environment for plant diseases. So high humidity, uh, warm, so there are tons of diseases there. So it was a perfect place to learn about plant diseases. Uh, and to the right of that photo, next to UF, I have a photo of the medical symbol. And so that was part of my program. That was part of the symbol of the degree that I had. And so this is where I wanna poll you guys. I have a question for you guys. Um, so what do you think is around the stick and the medical symbol? And if there are any questions at this time, I'm more than happy to answer them as we let you guys take this poll. So you can decide if it's a nematode, a snake, or a worm. Allison, I think most of the people have voted. I'm going to give them about five more seconds and then I'm going to shut it down. Okay, perfect. We do have a question. What is a nematode? Oh. Oh, I don't know if I want to answer that. <laughs> um, Let's wait for the poll and then I'll answer it. So I'm sharing the poll results now. Can you see them? Um, no, I cannot. So we had 22% uh, said the nematode, 70% said the snake, and 9% said the worm. And if you do math, you'll see that that adds up to a little bit more than 100% but the polls seem to be a little bit off when they calculate their percentages. <laughs> In the ballpark, okay, that's all we need. But the snake um, was the, was the um, most common choice. Yeah, it, it certainly resembles a snake, but it's actually a nematode, and so that's why I didn't want to answer the question, because the next slide, um, here we go. I'll explain what a nematode is. Um, so, a nematode is an unsegmented roundworm. It's microscopic. Um, when I talk about plants, it's microscopic, but there are nematodes that are quite large that are, you can see with the naked eye. Um, so the plant parasitic, meaning that it will attack plants, nematode is all the way to the left. Um, you might actually know what a nematode is without even knowing. So how many of you give your dogs heartworm? Heartworm is actually a nematode. And the symbol with the stick and the nematode around it actually came from, and this is a really gross story, so I apologize, but it will, it will make you understand it better. Um, when physicians started to um, 
work with humans and you know doctors were a new thing what would happen is people would actually get nematodes inside their body they're parasitic meaning they live inside uh, and so what would happen is they would actually have to like slice a portion of your skin grab the nematode wrap it around a stick and go like this to take it out and so the ne the uh, stick had the nematode wrapped around it and so that's where the symbol came from so humans can get nematodes, animals can get nematodes, and uh, plants can as well. Um, so I'll focus on the plant side of things, uh, but they're also beneficial nematodes too. They're not all scary. Um, when we talk about nematodes affecting plants, you can see here there's a stand of what looks like corn, and there's a portion of that corn that's not growing very well, and that's due to nematode infecting that plant. And so an example of a symptom uh, it, of how a nematode could affect a plant is all the way to the right, that photo there. It kind of looks like the roots are galled. And so the nematode is, is the reason why those roots are, roots are galled. And so the plant has a hard time taking up the proper nutrients and water to grow um, at the pace that they should. And so that's why there's a declining rate kind of in the center of that circle of that corn stand. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's something you guys didn't know, it seems. Uh, but we have a quick question about the nematodes. Um, we yeah. are asked, does the original Greek version depict a nematode? Yeah, so there are uh, very few references. And even if you look online, um, some folks will even say that it is a snake. But if you go back to like the biblical times, um, where they are referenced, it does reference uh, the, the nematode. As far as the Greek, I'm having to like reach back to my intro to nematology in grad school. I know that there were some references of way back when, when they decided that it isn't a snake, it is a nematode, so yeah. Okay. So I said that I'm a plant pathologist, meaning that I study plant diseases, and I currently run the plant disease diagnostic lab at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. So this is my lab, and this is where the detective part of my job comes in. Um, so you can see here, uh, there are two lamps. Uh, so that's where I would take a plant sample and start diagnosing, or triaging is what we would call it. So trying to figure out what might be wrong with a plant. Um, this lab is where individuals can send samples in. So they would be homeowners, gardeners, you yourself could send a sample in. Um, but I also work with really large farmers and uh, nursery industry and seed industry with trying to help them figure out if they have a plant disease and if that's the cause of the symptoms that they're seeing. Um, and then I rely heavily on microscopes to help me determine if there's a disease present on the plant. So these are things uh, that are potentially coming into my lab. I'm, I'll start with the woman right in the middle wearing the lab coat. This is a student that works in my lab. I've been fortunate to have her work in my lab for um, well, this will be the third summer in a row. She's an undergraduate student uh, studying environmental science. And by working in my lab, interning, she realized that she loves lab work and is currently applying uh, and getting accepted, which is really exciting, into graduate school right now for her master's and PhD. Um, so I will just say, you know, in my story with trying to figure out where I was going. It was the internship that really sealed the deal for me. Uh, and I feel like this is true for her as well. So I am a big fan of internships. Um, and if you can find them, they're invaluable. Uh, so I will start with the tulip all the way to the left. You might notice if you're out recently that the tulips are now germinating and coming up and getting excited about them flowering. This tulip though, it doesn't look so great. You wouldn't wanna necessarily cut this tulip and place it in a vase and put it in the center of your table. You might not, I definitely would. Um, but you can imagine that for cut flower farmers that that's not something that they 
want to grow. Um, and that's actually due to a fungal disease that caused the symptoms of the petals kind of looking not so great. Um, the lower photo there, kind of distorted fruit, that's a tomato. Uh, and that's a tomato that is having a disease issue um, and it's causing that odd growth. All the way to the top are apples. This is called apple scab. This is a fungal disease that attacks apples. Uh, farmers deal with this a lot and homeowners. I know I, I have apple trees in my yard and they get this um, every year. So it's a real struggle. And then the photo down on the bottom of the tree branches with the galls, those are actually also in uh, my yard. I, clearly I have a lot of disease in my yard, but that's okay. Um, so these galls are caused by a fungal disease too. Uh, you might not have ever thought that plants get diseases, but you can see here, I mean, I see diseases everywhere. Once you know what they look like, you can really pick them up um, wherever you are. And then I have a photo all the way to the right uh, of me in my lab that is a turnip. So it's a carrot-like vegetable, but it's white. And you can see that it has um, black uh, structures, fungal structures growing on the top. I'm pretending like I'm going to eat it because to me it looks like a snow cone. You know, those ice creams with like the little bits of chocolate on the top. Uh, I clearly have a weird sense of humor, but also like to have fun while doing lab work. So. Uh, we do have a quick question uh, about the apples. Uh, we have someone wondering if they would still be edible with the spots on them, the scab. Yeah, they are. They're a little tougher on the portions that are scarred. So most people will just cut around them and then either bake with them or slice them up and eat them. Yeah, they're definitely edible. Great question. Thanks. Okay, so samples come into my lab and I try to identify them. And I do that through a number of process. So if I get a plant in and I can't identify it just by symptoms uh, or confirm because maybe it's um, producing structures that I can identify what the pathogen is, I will, what I call plate it. So I'll take little bits of plant material and I will put it into auger. And then I will encourage whatever it may be causing disease to grow. And so this is called a Petri dish all the way to the left. And you can see that there are a number of different organisms growing that Petri dish. Um, I didn't have, oddly enough, any photos of a Petri dish that I would work with that would have the plant material in it. But after five to seven days, after I plate uh, the plant material in the auger dish, I'll look at that Petri dish under the microscope and identify the, the pathogen that's present if it's a fungal disease. Um, and I can do that by looking at things called spores. So fungi have spores uh, and that's how the, it's almost like a seed. And so they disperse and cause more disease and they're, they're usually unique in the way that they look. And that's how I can generally figure out what fungal disease is present by doing this process. We have a question, what's an auger? Auger, great. So auger is a nutrient source for the fungi uh, or bacteria, and it's almost like a jelly-like substance. So you can see there in that Petri dish, which I'm just referring to that shape, it's just a dish. Um, we put the auger in there, it hardens, solidifies into a jelly-like substance that then I can put the plant material in and grow on. So that's what auger is. Yeah, thanks. So that's how I identify fungal diseases most of the time, um, but plants get more than just fungal diseases. Although the number one cause of disease is a fungal disease, but they also get viruses. They also get bacteria diseases. Um, and obviously we already covered uh, plants also being affected by nematodes as well. So in the photo to the right, this is actually a tobacco plant. I grow tobacco and tomatoes in my greenhouse. Um, and the reason why I do this is because those plants are very good at identifying uh, 
pathogenic diseases. And when I say pathogenic, I mean that they cause disease. So if I get a plant in that I think has a bacteria disease, I try to isolate, meaning I try to get a single bacteria all by itself, and I use those petri dishes filled with auger to do that. And then once I have it isolated, I inject it into this tobacco plant and tomato plant. But I don't have a photo of that. And so I inject it by using a, a syringe, just kind of like a needle, and I push a syringe into the plant tissue with the bacteria in it that I have isolated. So it's living bacteria at this point. And so when I inject it into the plant, I'm looking to see if it causes this browning on the leaf. So when you do any test, you have to make sure that you have a positive control, meaning that it will do what you want it to do, and then you'll have a negative control to make sure the test is working. So the plus is my positive control. I have a bacteria that I know is pathogenic, I know causes disease, and I'm inoculating the plant with that. And at the same time, I'm inoculating that tobacco plant with just water, which I'm considering my negative control, which will not cause disease, it's not pathogenic. And then I have my unknowns, which are those numbers right there. So I have 392B, 392A, these are all different bacteria. Um, and if you can see at the base of it, 349B, my handwriting's horrendous, I apologize. Um, you can see that it, cause disease. So now I have a bacteria that I know is pathogenic, causes a disease, and then I have to take it a few steps further with figuring out what particular uh, bacteria that might be. And then once I come to the end of diagnosing, I can then determine if um, the management recommendations on how they can manage that bacteria and fungal disease. Okay, so we can do poll two, if you don't mind. And it's, do you think you have seen plant diseases before? Yes or no? And maybe you didn't even know what it was at that point. Are there any questions that have come in that maybe I can answer while people are taking that? Not any right now, but just a reminder, uh, the tab that says Q&A at the bottom is where you type your questions in and I will, I will ask them to Allison when, it, when the time comes up. So over 80% of our participants have voted at this point. I'm gonna close out the poll in about five seconds. And over 90% of the respondents say that they have seen a plant, they think they have seen a plant disease before. That's awesome, yeah. I would say that most people don't even know that maybe they've had a plant disease. So kudos to you guys. Clearly you're looking at things um, and picking up on small detail, which is and really what- did, we, Oh, sorry, we did get the question, have you seen fungus or something in trees? Yeah, so that, that tree photo of the branches with the galls, and I can go back because I think that was only right there um, at the base, that's caused by a fungal disease. Yeah, trees, they get a lot of fungal diseases. Actually, the scab is a fungal disease too on those apples up above. So, yes. Okay. And I forgot I had this slide, uh, another example of a fungal disease. So this was, I wanted to show you guys ones that maybe you would be most likely to see in the next few months. And I thought this one, it's the most prevalent um, and kind of most obvious, especially if you already know the name of it. So this particular disease is called tar spot and it affects maples. So at the top, I have a healthy leaf right there. Um, that's a Norway maple. It's actually an invasive plant, meaning that it's not supposed to grow here, but it is because someone uh, took it from Europe, 
and planted it here and now it grows like crazy um, because there's not a, a competitor competing with it. But almost every single year, Norway maples and other maples, sugar maples not so much, so if you're looking at a sugar, sugar maple, you probably won't see this, but Norway maples definitely uh, will get tar spot. And I get countless emails of folks that are looking at their Norway maples in their yard and realizing that they have these black spots, large black spots on their Norway maple leaves. Uh, you'll see this generally in late summer, uh, fall time, and it can be alarming. Uh, it starts off pretty small, but those black spots can, when it's really bad, can almost take over the entire leaf. And because it's affecting the entire leaf, Sometimes you can get premature leaf drop, meaning that the tree is dropping its leaves early. And so I saw this a lot in Massachusetts where the trees get it so bad that it drops the leaves, thinking that the photosynthates, um, the capacity for photosynthesizing has been reduced so much, meaning that it's not able to produce sugars as well as if it was healthy, they start dropping their leaves um, and then we'll push out another flush of leaves. And if you can imagine, that's really costly to the plant. It takes a lot of energy to push out leaves every single um, spring. And so by doing this twice in a year, it can really knock down the energy of a plant. Uh, and then those leaves fall to the ground. And then what happens is if you don't rake your leaves that fall, um, the following spring, those leaves will then, with those leaf spots, will sporulate. So those spores that I was talking about, they blow through the air and that's how the fungal disease move. And they'll infect the healthy leaves. So about this time, if you haven't raked your leaves, this would be a really great time to do that, to kind of break this circle, um, this pattern of disease. Um, so that's really the management recommendation, recommendation that I would give, but I guarantee if you're in a park or, or walking down um, you know, a main street of a town, you'll find Norway maples and you'll find in the fall that it has this disease. So I welcome you all to try to find it. And then you can sound really smart that you know what this disease is uh, that's um, causing these symptoms. So. Now I have a few questions if you're ready for them. I am, yeah. Um, going back to the agar, um, how do you isolate a fungus if it refuses to grow in the agar, like if it needs a specific host? Yeah, that's a really great, so you gotta be persistent. <laughs> so uh, there are hundreds of thousands of fungi. And so every single one, kind of like baby, they prefer certain things. So some of them like high sugar content. Some of them don't prefer sugar content. Um, some of, some of them like different temperatures. And so luckily there is a lot of research on how to do that. But there are some organisms where either it's incredibly difficult or it's unculturable. Um, and so when a pathogen is unculturable, meaning it won't grow on the auger for anyone or at any temperature with any kind of auger, um, that's when we actually start doing DNA testing. So we look at the DNA or RNA uh, of a particular pathogen, and then we can identify what that pathogen is by looking at that DNA of the plant. All right, our next one, we have the question, what makes trees lose their bark? Yeah, so I actually got an email from someone um, Friday who had an apple tree and the bark was coming off. And Bark can come off a tree when a tree is dead. So that's one reason, just the tree is dead and it's starting to degrade over time. Uh, another reason could be a wound. Um, so either one thing that I see often coming into the lab is that folks will have a crack down a tree and the crack can be caused from either sun scald is what we call it, um, or through from ice. So it's a, you know, it's, a, it's an injury that occurs uh, due to 
highs and lows of temperatures that ends up just breaking the wood and then the bark can start to peel back in that particular area. So I think that there are, there are a few things that could show that one symptom, but those are kind of the most common ones that I would say. We have an interesting question. Can you get a disease from this fungus on a tree? No, you cannot. No. Um, there are very, very, very few pathogens that can infect a plant that can infect a human. There is one that I know, well, two that I know of actually, um, but it is incredibly unheard of. You have to have right place at the right time kind of thing in a lower immune and a wound or something like that. I, I myself, I work with pathogens all day long. I don't wear a mask um, generally, unless I work with stinky, rotting garlic or potatoes, don't wear gloves. Um, and that's a normal protocol. So there's nothing to be concerned about with uh, your human health with the plant disease in most cases, yeah. All right, just a couple more. Um, one is, most of the beech trees around me are dying of a fungal disease. Do you know what the disease is called and what I could do to help? Yeah, um, I do know what it's called. It's called beech bark disease. So I was actually uh, walking last week and I walked into an area where it was just all beech. And it was like in a horror movie, it seems like, because the, the beach, so normally beach trees, they have really smooth gray, almost like an elephant kind of skin on the bark. Um, but beach bark disease creates these nasty, like pimply-like um, bumps on the, uh, the tree trunk. And so it's so prevalent and it is so widespread that there is nothing that you can do. Um, so one of the things that researchers have been doing for decades now um, are breeding resistant or at least tolerant plants um, like beech to withstand that disease so that they're, um, you, can, you can buy these and replace them with the diseased ones if you have them in your yard. But the issue with that and the reason why it is so widespread was that we, sent, we tend to go through trends. So there was a trend back in the day where everyone was buying those trees and planting them. And so we had, you know, the landscape was covered with them and it created an opportunity for the pathogen to take advantage of it. Whereas if we diversified a little more with different trees, we probably wouldn't have had this big of an issue. So resistance. Okay, and one last question before we move on. Have you ever studied, and forgive any butchering I do of the pronunciation here, Hamiliaea vasta, vastatrix, which is coffee leaf rust, before? Uh, no, I haven't studied coffee, uh, but I do work with a lot of different rusts. Um, rusts are a really common fungal disease and we get rust on crab apples a lot here in the state of Maine. Um, cedars are the alternate host for that. So this particular rusts are really interesting where that they're really smart because the, the fungal organism has to have a host to survive, which is unique, not all of them do. So this would be actually a really great example of where you couldn't grow it in auger. Uh, it would have to be on a host. So, the ones that are here in Maine, I'll just reference, uh, they, they will infect cedar uh, during the winter, and then they will then jump on to crab apples during the summer, because obviously in the winter, the crab apples don't have any leaves. And so it, it needs both hosts to survive through the year. So no, I have not studied that particular um, rust before, but yes, I do work with many rusts. Geez, it sounds like we have plant pathologists in here. This is great. <laughs> okay, so I will continue going, but if you have questions, certainly feel free to ask them. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. So we are all stuck in our houses, um, and I don't know about you, but there are particular things that you are unwilling to give up. And so with me, it's diagnosing and looking at diseases. 
So I have this photo here on the left of a healthy tomato. You know, this is what you're hoping for when you grow tomatoes. But these are the tomatoes that I got uh, recently from the grocery store. So these tomatoes, you might imagine, um, look healthy except for the fact that they have these really weird dots in a circle. Um, and these are, this is a symptom of a virus. And so these tomatoes have a particular virus um, and it is vectored by an insect. And when I say vectored, I mean that the insect helps in spreading the virus. So the virus particles get on the insect and then that insect can move it around to healthy plants that then become infected with the virus. Um, so this, this is a, uh, those tomatoes, I mean, I ate them. I, I made that pizza right there to the right, which I had to show off because that's like the best pizza I've ever made. And it was delicious. Um, and the tomatoes had virus, but it was completely fine. So you can find a lot of different diseases in supermarkets, actually. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it might be something if you're bored, you can check out your refrigerator and see if any of your produce has diseases on it. So. Okay, so if you've never heard of the potato Irish famine, um, I just wanted to introduce this because this is when folks really started to take diseases on plants really seriously. Um, over 1 million people passed away because there was a famine, meaning that people went hungry and died because they didn't have enough food. And in Ireland, when this happened, they were heavily reliant on potatoes as a subsidence to get them through the winters. Um, and what happened was that they would harvest the potatoes and then they would put the potatoes in a hole in the ground and then they would bury them. And that was how they stored them. So as the winter progressed, you know, they would, they would dig the hole and, and feed on those potatoes. But over time, what they were finding was that those potatoes were rotting. And I have a rotting potato on the top right there. Um, and that's a potato that has a disease. And so this particular disease uh, is a fungus-like organism is what we call it. And we actually still have this disease now today. Uh, and it's something that we in Maine uh, search for. And so we have scouts at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension that go out to potato fields and will look for any symptomatic uh, plants that may be showing uh, any disease symptoms. And they will bring those samples back to me and then I will look at them under the microscope and try to see if this is late blight, um, which is the, the name of the disease that caused the potato famine. So this is something that, you know, it happened a long time ago, yet we still have this disease, we're still combating it, uh, but we have the resources now, like really fancy microscopes that you can look under and catch things early, um, and we know about it, and we breed for, you know, varieties of potatoes that maybe are less resistant to this disease, and we have things like um, pesticides that we can use if we have to, if there's a chance of, you know, devastation to a crop, so. I think, oh, you have a question? Uh, I do have a question. Um, why do strawberries mold faster in the grocery store? <laughs> yeah, that's because they've traveled so far. Uh, I, yeah, they've, they've traveled most likely um, from Florida, depending on the time of year, your strawberries will either come from Florida if they're not local or they will come from California. And so, they have traveled really far. And so the length of their life has already been reduced by the time that you get them. And so that's why if you know you push them in the back of your fridge and they start getting that gray mold on it, um, that, that's kind of inevitable for most strawberries to get that disease. And that's a disease most strawberry farmers deal with a lot. Um, I put in my little kind of short paragraph there that I also own a strawberry farm, and that's one of the diseases that can really uh, shorten the length of the, the lifespan of the strawberry itself. So, yeah. Okay. 
So um, I think we can do poll number three now. So the way we're going to do poll question three is we're going to ask you to put in the chat box what you think is the number one crop produced in Maine, because we can't do open-ended questions in the polls. So oh, okay. You just type in the tap uh, in the chat box what you think is the number one crop produced in Maine, and then we'll ask you if you're correct once uh, Allison fills us in on the correct answer. I just also have to comment as a plant person, I really love the name Autumn, so. <laughs> and Sage, oh my goodness, you're all plant people, or your parents were at least. So it looks like blueberries and potatoes are the top two. I don't think there's any way to reference how many of you have actually chimed in, but I will say that the top two in Maine are potatoes and blueberries. So kudos to everyone for getting that right. Um, but it is actually potatoes are number one uh, produced crop here in the state of Maine. Uh, apples are also up there as well. <laughs> okay, now I'm getting distracted by, <laughs> yes, mushrooms. I love mushrooms too. Uh, I actually had mushrooms in my bouquet in my wedding, so I'm with you on that one. Uh, so I think, I think that's actually my last slide here which I think we're right on time, am I right? You are great on time. Does anybody have any other questions while we're here? While we're waiting for some possible questions, I'm gonna put up a poll about some future topics to choose from. And I'm hoping that if our viewers don't see a topic they're interested in, please mention it in the chat box. These topics came from uh, last week's viewers and there were a lot of great ideas. So we're gonna see what we can get for future speakers. Um, also, for our, our viewers today, I hope you check out all that 4-H has to offer. We're, we have a lot of recipes, activities, and more at our new 4-H Learn at Home website. And we have another one of these quarantine science cafes coming up next week with Chef Rob. Chef Rob's gonna talk about his pathway from a dishwasher to the White House to the University of Maine. I do see that the Q&A box is starting to light up. So, Jesse, do you have a couple more questions to ask? We do. Yes. Awesome. Um, we have the question, how do you make plants more disease resistant? Um, so that's generally breeding. So it's breeding plants um, by just sometimes just trial and error. So they'll grow plants that they bred, see how well they do, if they would stand well to particular diseases, then they'll take that line and then sell the seed um, and then breed that with something else that maybe, you know, if they have a potato that is um, less likely to get late blight and then they have another potato that tastes really good, they might breed those two together and hopefully get a potato that tastes good and is resistant. So it's all in the breeding. Yeah. And there is a huge shortage in breeders right now across the country. So if plants are your thing and genetics are your thing, there is money to be made for sure and a job waiting for you. 
And we have the question, what are the top funguses and diseases that you'll find in a home garden? Hmm. Top five. Okay, I can do this. Well, it depends on what you grow, but I'm just going to talk about my garden, I guess. Um, and It wasn't the top five. It was just what are the top ones, so you don't have to do five of them. Oh, what are the top diseases that you... Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So I would say powdery mildew, and that affects cucurbits, tomatoes, um, beans. When I say cucurbits, I mean like cucumbers, pumpkins. Um, that's in the, the family cucurbit. Um, powdery mildew is, uh, it affects the foliage, the leaves first, and you can tell if it's powdery mildew because it looks like someone took, dropped their dough boy that you got at the carnival and dropped it on your plant. It's like all that white is on your plant and you can actually rub it off with your hand. And that's a good um, way to tell if it's powdery mildew. I would say that's a really common uh, disease in the home garden, vegetable garden that is. Um, we have the question, was the Irish potato famine caused by a virus, fungus, or bacterium? So it's a fungus-like organism, sorry. Yeah, so it, it's not in the kingdom of, of fungi, um, but it's closely related uh, in that it's actually considered a water mold. So it needs water to initiate disease. So the spores can actually, they almost look like little fish in the soil. They move around in the water in the soil. And what would you say about the lobster mushrooms that grow in other fungi? I wouldn't say anything because I, <laughs> I am not a mycologist by any means. I don't know really anything about mushrooms. I love them, I think they're beautiful, but I, I yeah, I don't know much about mushrooms to be honest. Um, so a mycologist is someone who just focuses on mushrooms. Um, and then I cover everything else. I should learn mushrooms. Yeah. Sorry. That's it I've got for questions for now. Okay, perfect. I've also put up an end of session evaluation. If you guys could take us a minute or two to fill that out for us, that would be really helpful. Um, in the meantime, Dr. Smart, thank you. So yeah, thank you. much. And I hope someday we'll get a chance to bring some some youth in to visit your lab. That would be great. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. Great. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you coming out and joining us today. So thank you everybody for coming out. We'll be back here next week. Share any additional topic ideas you have with us. We would love to hear from you and what you would like to hear about as far as cool science opportunities. I hope you all have a great week and I hope to see you here next week.